Good morning, everyone. Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician at Gates Way to Health. Today, we're talking about concussions and are we doing enough to prevent them? Uh, we've talked a lot about concussions in the last several weeks, and we've been discussing all the different facets of brain injuries from why someone has a brain injury and they're seemingly fine, and others have brain injuries and then they develop devastating lifelong consequences. We've talked about how the blood-brain barrier can break down excessively in traumatic brain injury patients. We've also talked about new imaging modalities to really document that somebody has had a brain injury. So many people with concussions are told that they're normal and that they're absolutely fine, that their MRI is fine. And really those MRIs are just looking at structural issues in the brain. They're looking at bleeds. They're looking for signs of hemorrhage. Uh, but they're not looking at the microstructural facets of traumatic brain injury. So we've talked about all that, and good morning to everybody who's joining. And so today, I just wanted to do a little segment on, are we doing enough to prevent concussions? And we're doing this in part <clears throat> because of some recent news this week. Uh, we lost another boxer this week from a traumatic brain injury. This is the fourth death this year from uh, boxing and it raises some questions that are we doing enough to prevent these head injuries clearly most of the sports now have some sort of concussion inventory they have some sort of assessment before the season and they're doing an assessment after head injuries which is well and good but is it enough to prevent brain damage? Is it enough to prevent things like fatalities in the ring? I believe there's something like 54 fatalities, don't quote me on that, but there are around 54 fatalities from brain injuries since it's been recorded. I think it was back in around 1950 was when they first started keeping track of deaths due to boxing. But we've had four this year. I think there was one in 2017, around one in 2016. So it's somewhat curious why, why are the numbers going up? And especially that's such an alarming number. Uh, we're not talking about someone who, you know, has a traumatic brain injury and comes out of it and has some memory issues in the future. And I'm not saying that uh, tongue in cheek. I'm not saying that lightly. I would just say we're talking about people who go in the ring and then all of a sudden they don't come out of the ring. And I don't know. If any of you have watched some of these fights, it's, it's pretty concerning. So I'm not knocking the sport of boxing. I'm not knocking uh, ultimate fighting. I'm not knocking football. I'm just saying from a clinical standpoint, was there maybe anything we could have done better? And that opens up the umbrella really to a variety of, of situations because do we need to start looking at doing MRI scans before a boxer goes into that fight? Are these boxers sustaining lots of traumatic brain injuries during their training that are going unassessed and you know as is common in contact sports you know people are not going to complain they're taught not to complain how can you complain when the basis of the sport is your will against another human being and fighting through the pain so i think the regulatory boards i feel that the really the regulatory boards for all of these um athletic endeavors are doing things that make it look like they're making an effort and certainly they're doing good things but are we doing enough and i've been talking with friends about this lately based on what we now know where we can actually see structural changes in the brain should we be doing those types of brain mris on pro uh pro athletes before the season and then if they get a concussion do one afterwards and then before we send them back into the arena of play, should we make sure that their brain MRI looks like it should have, you know, before the season? These are, I feel, legitimate questions that need to be kind of posed based on what we now know. For those of you who are out there who are not as familiar with some of the preseason uh, inventories, there are different ones, like the SCAT-3 is one of the biggest ones. And basically what they do is they take a, an athlete through a variety of tests they may put them through neurocognitive testing like the impact test so they get the baseline there but these are more like neurological test balance tests things like that how fast they can move their eyes or how well they move their eyes with the king devic test 
but it's not an MRI scan of their brain if that's what we're really concerned about. And some people don't like that I bring up MRI scans as much, but I would say based on the current evidence, you know, we use testing for every other condition, ailment out there. You know, you go to your cardiologist, they're not saying, well, I, I think you're okay. You know, they're doing an echocardiogram, they're doing an EKG, they're doing a stress EKG. They're doing all these tests because the tests tell them, do you have this or do you not? Well, we now have that luxury with brain injuries, so why aren't we doing more of the testing? And I think I would recommend sharing this with friends, talking about it with friends, because the more we get this out there, I think the more uh, it's going to start the discussion that needs to happen and saying, hey, yeah, I, you know, you guys are really, I hate saying you guys, but this regulatory board, they are making an effort, but are we making enough of an effort? So that's one piece. We had a question this week about supplementation after brain injuries. What do we recommend? In the acute phase, I typically use high dose uh, fish oil after a head injury. Uh, I'm not recommending this to you because none of you are my patients, but I would say uh, we use around somewhere from seven to 12 grams of fish oil a day for about a week for patients who have had traumatic brain injuries. These are more the mild traumatic brain injuries, concussions, things like that. I'm not talking about someone who's had a subdural hematoma or a skull fracture or a bilateral hemorrhage into their frontal lobes. So that's what I would say there. Interestingly, there is some information coming out on cannabis being neuroprotective uh, after head injury. So just got to talk about the research, not for it or against it, but there is some evidence in support of that as well. Now, do any of you have any other concussions on traumatic brain injury while, while we're talking about this? I kind of wanted today to be free flowing. I kind of wanted today just to kind of be a recap of everything we've done. Any other major points that you all want me to discuss, uh, I can go over those in future weeks, but I really feel that we've started to kind of create a complete picture of the concussion patient, what they're going through, why they're not getting better, why they're under so much stigma or so much scrutiny uh, after head injury when they appear seemingly normal. Um, one element I don't think I've hammered on enough are the mitochondria. Our, mito our mitochondria are the energy producing organelles of our cells. They help us to make energy, it's called ATP. Well, your brain is 2% of your body weight. It consumes 20% of the oxygen. What that means is that your brain is the most energetically dependent organ in your body. And when we hit our head, our mitochondria don't work as well. In fact, they've done studies after traumatic brain injuries where the, where the mitochondria actually break down. And the mitochondria work like Hoover Dam. So if the dam breaks, and we have water pouring out of it. We actually don't have water going through the chutes down below the dam where the turbines turn. So then if we have water flowing out of the dam, we're not going to be able to make energy the way that we would want to. So that's where head injury is so important as it relates to mitochondrial function. And for those of you who have had head injuries and you just have trouble thinking and you have trouble focusing and your attention is good for a few hours and then, you know, you just have to go lay down. This is a big reason why. This is absolutely a big reason why. Another factor behind fatigue that's really important just to recap for post-concussion patients is this entity called POTS, Postural Orthostatic Tachycardia Syndrome. We're finding that at the base of the brain down here in the cerebellum, that the cerebellum seems to have selective damage after the head is shook in the skull and that damage dysregulates how we coordinate blood pressure. So our cerebellum is very important in talking to our brainstem to make sure that the heart beats correctly when you stand up, that we get blood from our feet back up to our brain when we stand up, and that, that reflex does not work correctly, we're finding in post-concussion patients. So anybody you know of post-concussion syndrome who's not getting better, you really need to recommend that they be screened for POTS because POTS, has been shown to be a limiting factor for concussion recovery. And once you get the POTS to go away, the post-concussive symptoms go away. 
in large part. I think it was around two-thirds of post-concussion patients that's been found to be a case. To be technical, one-third had orthostatic hypotension where they just had low blood pressure but their heart rate wasn't high. Another third had orthostatic hypotension with a high heart rate. That's POTS. So that's some information to chew on there. As you all have heard me talk about brain imaging as it relates to concussion, we've talked about volumetric studies. We've talked about spec scans a little bit. For those of you who are not familiar with spec scans, spec scans are a type of CT scan that look at, you would kind of think of it as blood flow. It looks at metabolism. And um, there's a famous psychiatrist out there who does spec scans on his patients. Spec scans can be of some utility in traumatic brain injury. Uh, I don't prefer them because I feel that most of the research has gone towards diffusion MRI. Um, where we can actually see the white matter tracks through the brain and we can see if there's been axonal damage in the brain. And so that's called diffusion tensor imaging. We also have volumetric MRI where we can see the density of each area of your brain. And even last week we were talking about certain types <coughs> of PET scans, which is kind of a derivation of a CT, but PET scans for diagnosing chronic traumatic encephalopathy. That came out in the New England Journal of Medicine this year. So that's a big deal. We actually have now radio tracers that you can inject into somebody and we're seeing the accumulation of tau in the brain. Tau is the abnormal protein that misfolds itself after traumatic brain injuries. And on that point, well let me finish the imaging. So also fMRI is another modality we use for traumatic brain injury patients that also looks at blood flow and how your brain is getting activated. So we have those pieces. <clears throat> where, is, where is the science going? Where are treatments going? Just so most of you know, I've talked about it relative to other conditions. It seems that medications are going the direction of this, this field called biologics. Biologics are medications which are immune cells that will attack some sort of inflammatory chemical in our body or receptor for an inflammatory chemical. Uh, the classic examples are Humira, which you are commonly seen being advertised, as well as uh, Enbrel. You see that on TV all the time. Well, now we have biologics for migraine headaches. There are biologics for cancer. They're now actually looking at making biologics for TBI patients. And they're looking at targeting prostaglandin receptors. Prostaglandins are an inflammatory chemical in our body, and prostaglandins most of you, if you know about them, would relate to fish oil metabolism. So if you have an injury, let's say I tear my bicep, and in my biceps muscle, I have muscle cells, and those muscle cells have an outer border to them that has a phospholipid membrane, so basically it's made of fat. Now we are what we eat, so to speak, right? And so if you're eating the standard American diet and you're eating meat that has been fed lots of grain, or you're eating tilapia that's farm fed, that's been eating a lot of grain. What we know is that the fat structure of that animal is gonna to shift to a very inflammatory profile. So now we're at the restaurant we're eating, we're at home we're eating, and these fats come into our body and those fats then make up our phospholipid membranes. And so now if you tear your bicep or you have a traumatic brain injury and you have tissue breaking down basically of your cells, you're gonna get a release of those fatty acids. So if you're made up of inflammatory fatty acids, guess what? You're gonna release and produce a lot of what are referred to as prostaglandins, leukotrienes. Leukotriene may be a familiar word for the asthma folks. A lot of the asthma medications are leukotriene inhibitors. What are they? They're inflammatory mediator inhibitors. So now in the concussion world, they're saying, okay, well we know there are releases of prostaglandins in the brain because of the injury. Well, should we then make medications that will kill prostaglandins or will kill the, or basically attach to the prostaglandin receptor so the prostaglandins can have an effect. That is definitely one area that science is going and it seems like it's gonna keep going in that arena. So just so all of you know, that is being actively researched right now. I read that this morning. Uh, do any of you have any other questions as it pertains to this whole, topic before I, uh, I kind of wrap it up. Anything else you would like me to discuss, I'd be happy to go through. 
But I think that's the general template and that's the rationale as I talk about prostaglandins for why fish oils seem to be or seem to have some efficacy in the acute inflammatory period after something like a head injury. And fish oils themselves are anti-inflammatory. There was a study done many years ago where this prominent neurosurgeon, ironically, who has some, some history in this whole TBI, um, CTE coming about, he, he uh, started doing studies on fish oils as it pertains to arthritis. And he found that he was able to get 80% of his patients off of non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs for their back pain by using fish oil. So, fish oil certainly can be effective. The reason why I don't recommend fish oil to all of our patients is that, you know, you have to look at cost concerns, I feel, for your patients. And while theoretically it's great to be taking a bunch of different stuff, I try to target and say, okay, what is the most effective? What is the most effective modality that we can use for this person? And so if it is a fish oil, it's going to be a fish oil. That's going to be $70 a bottle. But if, you know, fish oil is just maybe supplementary, that's why I don't always recommend it for other conditions. And also, as many of you know, if you can change your diet and do things like that, maybe that will help you to recover from something like a traumatic brain injury and reduce inflammation even more than just being reliant on a supplement. So I think that pretty well covers our, our, uh, our topic for this morning. Again, just kind of start the discussion with your friends about are we doing enough to prevent traumatic brain injuries? We are doing things now. Uh, sports organizations are certainly doing things to bring awareness to traumatic brain injury, to triage traumatic brain injury patients, to get baseline assessments before the season and after a head injury. And that's well and good, and we're definitely making an effort. Or, you know, are, but are we doing enough based on what we know? And that's really the question. Given that we've had four boxers die in the last, basically since July, four boxers have died since July. Are we doing enough? Maybe did those boxers have some brain damage going into the ring? Maybe not. I don't know. It's completely conjecture. But uh, based on what we know today, are we doing enough? to protect athletes. And by the same token, you know, I get it. It's a philosophical, it's an ethical question. Athletes are taking matters into their own hands. They're making, you know, informed decisions. So there's that element of it too. So I don't know. Um, we have a question, do I have strong opinions on the efficacy of krill oil? I think krill oil is great overall. Uh, my standpoint on that is the smaller the organism we're getting the omega-3 fatty acids from the better typically so krill are very small little creatures and i would say probably krill oil would be favorable over fish oil in general so that would be my opinion so yeah go krill oil and um appreciate all the positive comments this morning and uh and yeah so i think we pretty well covered a lot on traumatic brain injury I, i've kind of been scouring the research, trying to see if there's anything else we need to talk about. Uh, and that's, that's one question that I'm considering. Um, just so all of you know, traumatic brain injuries can be predisposing factors for Parkinson's. There is some association with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. There also uh, is association with Alzheimer's, but what we're finding is that the Alzheimer's is different from chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Um, and that the neuropathological changes we're seeing with CTE have been seen in combat veterans. It, they are seen in, in professional sports athletes, as have been mentioned. And um, these neuropathological changes seem to be amplified if you have a family history of Alzheimer's. And so that's where, and even if you have a family history of Alzheimer's and you have a head injury, that doesn't mean you're going to get CTE. And that's what's great. That's what's great about what we know now. Because once CTE came out, a lot of people were really scared. Like, oh my gosh, you know, I, I've had concussions and am I going to get this? And now with the current science, that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. A, I, I'm wondering, is it preventable if we do certain functional measures like what everything we talk about? I can't say that for certain. I don't have a research study on it. I don't have a longitudinal study on it. But that's one thing that I'm wondering. 
and we'll probably be proactively looking at with our patients. But I have seen concussion patients where when we do their assessments, even though they have a lot of symptoms, you know, their, their testing comes out good. So that's really encouraging. And I've had other patients who, you know, their memory is starting to go a little bit and we do their imaging and we say, Ooh, okay, we really need to pay attention here. So, so that's the, the reality of the matter. And that was another thing I was going to bring up. So another thing that they're looking at when I talked about biologics for concussion patients and attacking prostaglandin receptors, now they're looking at making biologics to attack tau. Pretty interesting. So again, tau is that misfolded protein. It's like the two by fours of our neurons. If our two by fours get warped, then the neurons start to collapse and things don't communicate correctly. Well, they're now trying to create medications that will attack the pathological form of tau. So kind of like taking out the bad two by fours. And that's another thing that you're going to be hearing a lot about. So, you know, it's interesting. It's interesting. Uh, a lot of the research is going the right direction. I still think we need more research. We need more focus on this issue. And I think the more, again, all of us discuss it, the better. So I think that pretty well covers it. Thank you all so much for joining and joining us over these last several weeks. Uh, anything else you can think about for traumatic brain injury, let me know. Next week might be our, our penultimate broadcast for now on TBI, uh, or maybe we'll keep going. I'm not sure. But just wanted to bring up some general topics today on, on athlete health and what we can do to prevent not only mild traumatic brain injury and post-concussion syndrome, but also fatalities associated with these sports. Okay, thank you all. We'll see you soon. Have a good Saturday. Have a good weekend.